Welcome back to my channel, and as always, thanks to my subscribers. I've been using tortoise switch machines for over 20 years now, and in that time, I have dismantled and rebuilt my layout four times. Each dismantling required clipping off and discarding wiring, which had been carefully installed, tested, and soldered. Each rebuilding involved unsoldering the clipped ends of wires and reinstalling, retesting, and resoldering new wiring. Much of that installation, testing, and soldering involved work underneath the layout. I decided there had to be a better solution, and I resolved to find it. My ideal solution had to be, first, modular. That is, every component in the system had to be identical to, and interchangeable with, the corresponding components in other systems. Second, plug and play. That is, no soldering required for the final assembly. Third, convenient. That means no work required underneath the layout. And fourth, low cost. I didn't want to spend anything near the cost of discarding an old tortoise and buying a new one. Here is the system I devised. As you can see, it consists of just three components. First, the tortoise itself. Second, a length of cable terminated on one end by a tortoise edge connector and on the other end by an RJ45 plug. And third, a board mounted RJ45 jack and a screw terminal block. The cost of these components is about $7 per switch machine or less than half of a brand new tortoise. Further, since the components are completely reusable, you'll only have to spend that $7 once. Here is how the system works. Slide the edge connector onto the tortoise circuit board. Insert the RJ45 plug into the jack and apply DC power to terminals 1 and 8. DC power can be applied by a manual DPDT reversing switch by an electronic device such as an Arduino, or by a DCC accessory decoder, such as an NCE Switch 8. I mount the jack terminal board behind my control panel. You can mount it anywhere you like, for example, behind the fascia. The key is to mount it close to the edge of the layout. This makes the terminals easily accessible. You will then have ready access to the two sets of auxiliary contacts provided by the tortoise, and those connections are through the screw connector terminal block, which is already connected to the tortoise. No additional soldering is required. In this video, I'll describe how you can build this system and thereby simplify your tortoise wiring. Here are the materials you'll need. First, of course, is a tortoise switch machine. Second is an edge connector designed to fit the tortoise circuit board. Third is the length of CAT5 cable, also called Ethernet cable. Fourth is an RJ45 plug. Fifth is an RJ45 jack. Sixth is a circuit board which will accept the RJ45 jack and an 8-pin terminal screw connector. Seventh is the 8-pin terminal screw connector designed for PCB mounting. Finally, you need a device to send power to the tortoise. For this video, I'm using a simple DP-DT switch. You'll also need a crimping tool designed for attaching RJ45 plugs to the cable. Let's start by soldering the jack and the terminal block on the circuit board. Notice that the jack only fits into the board one way. Snap the jack into the board, then apply flux to the two outside pins and solder the jack in place. Don't worry if flux spreads from one pin to another. Circuit board material is extremely non-wetting to solder, so it is almost impossible to create a solder bridge between two pins. Now apply flux to the other six pins and complete connecting the jack to the board. Next, insert an 8-pin terminal block in the board. Note that the wires only enter the block from one side so be sure the terminal block is oriented with that side facing away from the jack. Hold the terminal block in place with one hand while you solder the two outside pins into the board. Then solder the remaining six pins in place. Finally, check all your solder joints. A PCB solder joint should be conical in shape, as shown in the inset. 
I like to glue a label to the terminal block to help me remember the pin assignments. I create the labels using a spreadsheet program. The next step is attaching a plug to one end of the cable. Your crimping tool includes a blade designed to slice through the outer sheath of the cable. Line the cut end of the cable with the edge of the tool. Squeeze the tool and rotate the cable to cut through the sheath. Remove the sheath from the cable. Some Cat5 cable includes fiberglass strands like this to give the cable more strength for pulling the cable through cable runs. You can simply cut these fibers with a pair of scissors. The cable consists of four pairs of twisted wire. You need to untwist the pairs and separate the wires. This diagram shows the wiring convention for attaching the plug. You do not have to follow this convention, but you'll need to make every connection the same so your cables are interchangeable. Why not use this one? Note that some Cat5 cable use yellow and yellow-white instead of orange and orange-white for one of the pairs. Now you need to arrange the individual wires in the sequence shown on the wiring diagram. Once that's done, slide the wires into the plug, making sure the wires stay in the correct sequence. This sounds harder than it really is. The plugs have internal grooves to separate the wires and keep them straight. Once you have the wires partly inserted, check again to make sure you have the correct sequence and make any necessary changes. When everything looks good, push the cable into the plug as far as it will go. Now make one final check that the wire sequence is correct. Then insert the plug into the crimping tool and squeeze until you hear a snap. This does two things. It forces the contacts through the insulation on each individual wire and it closes a strain relief device inside the plug. At this point, the only way to remove the plug is to cut it off the cable. Now the plug fits nicely into the jack, as shown here. Before we move on, take a moment to test the plug installation. Occasionally, the contacts inside the plug can create a short between two adjacent wires. I always test to be sure that there is no connectivity between any two adjacent contacts. It's a lot easier to check for shorts when the plug is inserted into a jack, as shown here. As you can see, the resistance between pins 2 and 3 on this plug is only 0.7 ohms, indicating a short. That's why I've cut this plug from its cable. Looking at the plug, it seems fine. There is no visual evidence of a short. Next, we'll attach the edge connector to the other end of the cable. Remove about one inch of the outer cable sheath. As before, clip off the fiberglass threads, then separate the eight conductors. To make the soldering easier, I clip about a quarter of an inch from the two center conductors, about an eighth of an inch from the next two conductors, and about a sixteenth of an inch from the next two conductors. I leave the two outside conductors unclipped. Next, I strip about an eighth of an inch of insulation off each of the conductors. This cable uses 26 gauge solid connectors. Once the wires are stripped, I do the first set of conductivity tests on the cable. I want to be sure that all eight contacts on the RJ45 plug are connected to the proper wire. As before, it is easier to test this with the plug inserted into a jack. Checking the brown wire first, we see that this wire connects to pin one and only pin one as it should. Remember that pin 1 is the left-hand terminal as you face the front of the terminal block, so I'm actually testing pin 8 first, then pin 7, pin 6, and so forth, until I get to pin 1 last. The brown and white wire connects to pin 2, and so on. Circuitron changed the design of the tortoise in 2019. The original tortoise had a white circuit board. The new style tortoise has a green circuit board, and the dimensions of these two boards are slightly different, so we need two different sizes of edge connectors to match each tortoise. One supplier of edge connectors is Aculites, and they provide two models. The edge connector one 
model number 1000, and the edge connector 2, model number 10,000. Be sure you have the right edge connector. Sadly, this means that my original goal of completely interchangeable parts cannot be met. But what are you going to do when the manufacturer changes their product? As you can see, a Model 1000 edge connector won't slide on to the new style tortoise. Also, although the Model 10,000 will fit on a classic tortoise, there is enough lateral play that the edge connector contacts might bridge two adjacent contacts on the tortoise, leading to amazingly unpredictable results. Finally, note that the edge connectors have contacts on both sides, even though the tortoise only has contacts on one side of its circuit board. This makes the edge connectors reversible. Now let's solder an edge connector to the other end of the cable. Since I'm using a classic tortoise, I'll use a Model 1000 edge connector. Before I tin the wires, I straighten them with a pair of needle nose pliers to eliminate the curves caused by twisting the pairs. This will allow the wires to lie flat against the edge connector pins. If you tin the wires first, they are much harder to straighten. Now I can tin the wires, and then I tin the edge connector pins. Finally, we are ready to solder. I am using a 123 block to brace the edge connector against so it won't move. You could use a clamp, a vise, or a helping hand. Remember to slip on a short length of heat shrink tubing before you solder each wire. Then solder the wire to the corresponding pin. I solder the two outside wires blue and white and brown, first, then work my way in to the middle. When all the wires have been soldered, it's time for the DC power test. First I connect the plug end of the cable to the jack module. Then I can plug the edge connector onto the tortoise. When I apply power in one direction, the tortoise moves. I can also use my multimeter to test the auxiliary contacts. A resistance reading of 0L means the contact is open. A resistance of less than 1 ohm means the contact is closed. Next I can reverse the power leads and see the tortoise move to the other direction. Now we need to wire a reversing DP-DT switch. If you plan to use a DCC accessory decoder, such as an NCE switchet or a Digitrax quad stationary decoder to drive your tortoise, you can skip this step. I'm not going to show the entire process. This is a standard reversing switch. Connect the four corner terminals in an X using two wires. Connect two of the corner terminals to positive and negative DC power. And connect the center terminals to positions 1 and 8 on the terminal block. The finished switch is shown here. Now we can perform the final system test with the switch connected to DC power and to the terminal block as I just described. It's important to recognize that the complete system, the tortoise, the cable, the terminal and jack module, and the switch, form three independent circuits. The first circuit uses terminals 1 and 8 and provides power to the tortoise. The second circuit uses terminals 2, 3, and 4 and one set of auxiliary contacts in the tortoise. The third circuit uses terminals 5, 6, and 7, and the second set of auxiliary contacts. Remember, too, that instead of a DPDT switch, we could be moving the tortoise with a stationary decoder, or even with an Arduino with motor shield. We could also wire the power leads from a single DPDT switch to two tortoise machines to control a crossover with a single switch, as shown here. In any case, we still have the auxiliary contacts at our disposal, and the terminals connected to those contacts require no soldering, and they may be placed at any convenient location. We can use those auxiliary contacts to light indicating LEDs on a control panel, as shown here. Or we can use them to control signal aspects, as shown here. Or we could use them to route power to the frog in the turnout. Since the CAT5 standard is designed for high-speed digital signals, DCC signals to a frog will be transmitted flawlessly. If there is enough interest, I might someday produce a video demonstrating these applications. 
I have included links to all the products mentioned in this video in the comments below. As always, I would love to hear your questions and comments. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.